Good morning, everybody. Actually, Rose, I have something for you. Let me just go grab it virtually, obviously. Do, do. So that link, uh, Rose, is a really cool little animation video uh, about trinucleotide repeat expansions. Uh, and it does a much better job than I could of explaining. Come on, Tony. Uh, explaining how that works, right? So it's a, it's a really cool little video to watch. And actually, oh, you're welcome. Um, we High, which is uh, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, it's in Melbourne, Australia, um, has produced a bunch of really cool molecular animations, which are as best as they can make them true to actual what we know about how those enzymes work and what that stuff actually looks like. So if you can, you know, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, that's a really cool resource to look into. They have their own web page, all those different. Uh, animations on them. We'll probably be looking at a few later on if we can. But anyway, it's pretty neat. Uh, so while we wait for people to roll in and, and um, you know, people to get sorted out and stuff, I uh, want to leave the floor open for any questions, right? If anybody has any questions about the material from last class on Thursday last week, uh, now's a good time to kind of go through those before we get started on the next PowerPoint that we need to work through. So any questions that you may have, now's a good time. Uh, Dr. Crook, so I just wanted to ask, for the purines, they have three, wait, two rings, and that's why it's three hydrogen bonds because of the two rings? Uh, you're right, they do have two rings and pyrimidines have one. The uh, hydrogen bonds is actually because of the what's in the outer ring. Let's see if I can find a decent picture for you. Uh, what would I put in? All right, let's see if I can find... Uh, what I actually want. That's big enough for everybody to actually see what I'm talking about now. Um, yeah, well, that's not terrible. It's kind of tiny, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, let's share the screen so you can see what I'm looking at. Okay, so the this isn't ideal, unfortunately. Sorry, it's kind of like a, a Google search at short notice kind of thing. Um, but if you look at uh, the outer ring, right? Again, sorry, teeny tiny pictures. Let's see if I can. Yeah, well, look at that. We can zoom up a little bit. No, that's too much. Sorry, back down down. Technology isn't my strong suit, as you probably guessed. Anyway, so if you look at this part of the outer ring of adenine, right, we have um, a, a nitrogen and an amine group here, right? And so this nitrogen here is too far kind of out of the way, right, because there's a distance deal with hydrogen bonds. So because uh, nitrogen is a very electro, um, what's the right word? It's not electro positive. Uh, it really wants to grab onto electrons, right? So uh, nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine form, um, oh God, this is trying to, <laughs> polar covalent bonds, right? I'm trying to dig way back to Gen Bio 1. Right, where the electrons are pulled more to one end of the covalent bond than the other, right? So that's why uh, in water molecules, you have those um, hydrogen bonds form, 
right? And so the presence of these two nitrogens here creates polar bonds, right? So, pardon me, the, the nitrogen part, nitrogen atom here is going to be ever so slightly electronegative, right? the hydrogen, one of the hydrogens here is going to be ever so slightly electropositive, right? Because the nitrogen that it's attached to is pulling those electrons away from the hydrogen atom, right? Even though they're shared, right? They're not ions. They're still covalent bonds. The electrons that are shared in that covalent bond are found closer towards the nitrogen than the hydrogen, right? So we have a slightly electropositive here slightly electronegative here, that's how you form hydrogen bonds, right? And if you look at, oh, well, let's see if I can uh, zoom in a little bit, a little bit. Depending on obviously the orientation, right? The, it's kind of hard to explain this because they're actually gonna be the other way around, right? Because the, the anti-parallel nature of DNA. But you can see the same here in cytosine and guanine, right? Cytosine has uh, uh, essentially three possible spaces for hydrogen bonds to form. We've got an amine group here and here, so these are going to be slightly uh, these are going to be slightly positive, and we have an oxygen sticking out, which is going to be slightly negative. Those match perfectly with the opposites on guanine. Right, so we have a amine and nitrogen and oxygen. So this is going to be positive, negative, negative. Those match up with the positive, positive, and the negative here. Right, so that's what A allows those bonds to form. B is what dictates how many form. Right, it's the essentially what's present in this outer ring of the purine and in the ring of the uh, pyrimidine. And also it confers a specificity, right? Because if you look at uh, adenine, right, we're going to have a positive and a negative or slight positive, right? You know, these aren't ions, remember. Slight positive, slight negative. That's not going to line up with uh, cytosine very well or with guanine. The only thing that's going to line up well with is thymine. Right, so it's the actual kind of atomic composition of those rings that dictates how many hydrogen bonds they form and where those are and, and essentially what fits together. So it's an extraordinarily specific uh, mechanism, right? And that's why DNA replication and transcription is so very specific. Does that help? So the rings they're referred to what? Because I was getting confused with like what the rings were meant to, like the, oh, okay. the nitrogen kind of where they're so going to form. If this is a uh, this is a nucleotide here, right? So we've got the the phosphates, we've got the the sugar, and the rings always refer to the they're called nitrogenous bases, right? And they're nitrogenous because they've got lots of nitrogens in. Basically, that's all that that really means and so the uh when we're talking about the the rings the ones that matter obviously pyrimidines only have one ring right so that's the one that matters with purines they have a six carbon ring and a five carbon ring right you can see the the sugared kind of is down here really that should be upside down if we're being pedantic right um but it's this outer six carbon ring that matters, right? So guanine, this is gonna be the outer one down here. Adenine, pardon me, this six carbon ring is gonna be the outer one down here. So depending on what areas of electropositivity and electronegativity you have in those outer rings, and really it's not just the ring itself, it's really like the, it's like the face. Right, so you're only going to be able to form hydrogen bonds between the face of one six carbon ring and the face of the other six carbon ring. What's over here and over here, right, it's unimportant, right? It's really only what's physically close enough to form those short, weak bonds, right? And so, depending on what's in that 
face of that outer ring, kind of around here, if you can see where my cursor is moving, and around here, those are the, the regions of electronegativity and electropositivity that form hydrogen bonds. And so you only have two of those regions. You can see up here and here, so it's these two, this amine and the nitrogen and adenine, and it's kind of not very well in frame, it's over here on the your right hand side of the screen we've got another uh amine or kind of amine and this oxygen right it's just right at the very edge of my computer screen so you only have those two things at least i think it's between those two maybe it's between these two i'm not entirely sure the picture's kind of off the screen up at the top but either way you only have two possible regions to form hydrogen bonds right that's why if you have a a thymine try and bond with a guanine, for example, A, the, those regions don't line up right. And B, because it might be like positive, positive, and negative, negative, or positive, positive, negative, positive, right? So there's, there's not a precise alignment. And also, they don't stick together very well, right? So even though they might be able to form like one or maybe two bonds, those bonds are not optimal. And so they, they come apart very easily. So yeah, good question. A lot of biochemistry involved in that. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, anyone have any other questions? Let's bring up the chat. All right. I'm seeing what's down here. Cool. Okay. Well, if any do occur to you, um, just you know, shout them out. Right. I'm. I'm. I don't have a like a particular kind of schedule that I have to keep to, so I'm pretty easy. It's easy to uh, kind of change what I'm doing essentially based on what you need. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the next PowerPoint that we're going to cover. It's this one. Get this handsome fellow up on the screen. Look at him. He looks he looks a little bit smug. I always think in this picture, it's like, yeah, I've discovered Mendelian genetics and I'm going to have it named after me or something like that. I don't know. He was a monk, so probably smugness wasn't part of his uh, repertoire. But anyway, so uh, what do I want to cover with Mendelian genetics, right? So Mendelian genetics, a lot of people think of Mendel, right? Obviously, because it's named after him. And really, at the end of the day, what Mendelian genetics is all about is really transmission genetics or inheritance, the genetics of inheritance. And so it's central, like what really, really, really it's all about is how do you work out the probability of inher inheriting certain combinations of alleles or expressing a particular phenotype or having a particular genotype right so really what it is is uh math right it's like flipping coins and and working out the probability of getting a heads or a tail or even if you're i'm i'm no i'm a terrible gambler right because i i just don't like losing money which is not a good thing if you want to be a gambler um but really it's almost like poker in a sense, so what's the probability that you'll have a particular hand? What's the probability that you'll get uh, a particular card next time or blackjack or whatever, right? It's really mathematical. And the, the amazing contribution that Mendel make, made was that he took inheritance and so in, in genetic inheritance and basically codified it as a se series of fairly simple mathematical principles right in terms of probability right and he did this via a very uh formalized way right actually in many ways mendel was the first that we know of at least a uh, proper biological scientist right before him really we didn't have scientists we had what are called natural philosophers right and the idea there is that basically you go out into nature and you kind of stare at it for a bit 
you know, think about it for a while. And then you are go to the pub and then you just like argue with some other bar, natural philosophers for a bit. And you basically say, well, I think that, you know, birds fly backwards in winter, right? Because the, the earth's spinning the other way around or something, you know. And depending on how good you are at shouting about that and uh, how strong your force of personality is, people go, oh, yeah, that, those birds, they're going to be going backwards in a few months time, right? So really... Uh, a lot of what we think of as science didn't really exist uh, back in the, you know, the 1800s. I mean, it was kind of starting to emerge um, and kind of Darwin, you know, contributed some to that too, you know, like a conceptual framework. Um, but really Mendel was the one who kind of took that step further right in terms of record keeping right in terms of actually creating testable hypotheses right so something that we take for granted in science today really wasn't a commonplace uh method back in his day and also he is very very diligent about keeping records right and essentially doing large data sets to generate reliable data right so really what we think of as kind of normal scientific process right he was one of the the first proponents of that and that's in many ways why his work has stood the test of time that's why we call it mendelian genetics rather than you know huntian genetics or whatever you know from thomas hunt or oh, what was it morganian uh, whatever Thomas Hunt Morgan, who is the guy that really picked up on uh, Mendel's work, right? So that's really kind of those two things, both the the codification of the like the mathematics of inheritance, and also the process of science. Those two things are really the the major contributions that Mendel made to uh, biology. So he's kind of like the grandfather of of uh, of genetics really in many ways the father being uh thomas hunt morgan who worked with uh fruit flies drosophila he uh kind of picked up on his work and carried it at the early um early 1900s fun fact actually while we're going off on a little tangent the genetic distance or map distance between different loci between different genes let's say uh is called centimorgans so I'll just write that down. So that's not necessarily physical distance in number of bases, but that's uh, worked out from recombination experiments, which we'll get to later. Uh, that unit was created by Thomas Hunt Morgan's funding student, uh, Peter Stuyvesant, I think his name was. Uh, so we've got Mendelian genetics and centimorgans. So if you discover something like truly, truly amazing, you might have stuff named after you, I guess. Uh, so anyway, so really this is all about probability, right? And so he used a particular model, one which I don't care hugely for. I'd much rather talk about cats. They're much more fun when it comes to uh, uh, Mendelian genetics, but we have this, and so we're going to talk about it a little bit, right? And so, one of the things that he, uh, through both a mixture of kind of luck and judgment, I guess, hello, chance, um, he used a model organism, or he made it a model organism essentially, uh, which has a relatively short generation time, right? So it's feasible to use. Um, it's relatively easy to use, right? So you could try and use mice, I guess, but they'd be a complete pain in the butt to work with for this kind of work. Uh, and also it has a series of very easily observable traits, right? So a trait being uh, I don't know, seed color, for example, right? So there's two different phenotypes for seed color. We either have yellow or we have green. Similarly, pod shape, is another trait, flower position, another position, uh, another trait, and so on and so forth. Actually, just before we, oh, I can introduce my dog. She's snoring 
and sighing loudly on the couch next to, next to me. There you go. That's Luna the dog. She's she's one of her other dogs. In her usual position on the couch. Just like a greyhound. Anyway, so uh, actually before we kind of get going in, in too great a depth, we need to talk about language, right? Language is really important. Because without it, you're not going to understand a word that I'm saying. Well, you are going to understand some of them, but not all not the ones that really matter. And so at the bottom of this PowerPoint are some terms that you need to be very familiar with and comfortable with, right? And so we're gonna be using these a bunch and you really need to know what they mean because otherwise stuff is not gonna make sense, right? So these are really ones which you can kind of go back through and review, right? So uh, when I was, learning Spanish in Colombia, I used to um, have a little kind of notebook that I carried in my pocket. I wrote down all of the, the new Spanish words that I learned that day because I didn't know how to speak Spanish before I went to Colombia. And so every evening, I'll just read back through those and kind of make sure I knew what they meant, right? And just did that over and over and over again. And quite quickly, you become fluent in a, or at least uh, competent in a language. And this isn't really any different, right? So you need to be able to, you know, quiz each other or have family members quiz you or, or whatever on what these things mean and be able to give a good answer, right? So uh, these are fairly basic terms, right? I've talked about locus a few times, right? This is a kind of region on a chromosome that confers a particular trait. It's typically a gene right but not always alleles the, these this word is a very very important word right and one which you know i'm sure most of you are familiar with oh thank you rose she is very cute she's a lazy ass dog as well um this is a really important one because we're going to talk about this a lot this is basically a different form of a gene now that form could be as simple as a single base change, right? Doesn't even have to cause a change in the protein sequence or function of that gene. So if you remember when we were talking about uh, silent mutations last class, so if you change the third base in a codon, for a lot of codons, you don't change the amino acid, right? That change in the sequence of that gene is an allele right? Because it's a different form to uh, the one that wasn't mutated, right? The what we call the wild type version, right? Which is kind of the kind of normal version of that gene, right? So it could be something as simple as that. It could be uh, one which allele could be something that encodes, uh, the gene encodes a protein that doesn't work, right? Or works uh, differently from the other ones. Could be a whole bunch of things, but whatever it is, it's something that makes that gene different in one way or another to uh, another gene, right? And so we're gonna be using that term a lot. These are also, and again, I'm sure for the for a large majority of you, these things are things that you could tell me yourself, right? So if your eyes glaze a little bit, that's just fine. But I want to make sure that everybody knows these because they're very important uh, words to understand. So these are uh, also, these are essentially the, how we describe a genotype, right? So we're um, talking about whether they have, because we work with diploid organisms, right? You and I are, are diploid. We have two copies of each gene. Right, so you can have two that are the same or you can have two that are different, right? And so that's homozygous or heterozygous. Pardon me. If I'm not actually quite sure, I need money to change this. So really it's dominant phenotype and dominant or recessive phenotype because trait is what describes the, the thing itself, like seed color, right? So dominant basically means it's something that you see all the time 
Uh, recessive is what you see only when you have a homozygous recessive individual, right? So again, understanding these is important. Um, this is a true breeding at the top. This is another important one. This is essentially what describes a homozygous individual, right? So if you breed two homozygous individuals together, they're, they're both homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive, as long as they're the same, you'll only ever get the same back out again, right? So, you know, if you, so what we use in um, like dog breeding, for example, right? When you breed two uh, golden Labradors together, right? That are, that are true breeding, then you'll only ever get golden Labrador pups. You're not gonna pop out like a little rotty mix, you know, it's like, well, where did that come from? You know, you'll only ever get the exact same uh, genotype and phenotype in the offspring as in the parents, right? And so that's obviously it's important for dog breeders, but it's really important for what we're going to be talking about because that's an assumption that we're making for these two crosses, a monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, right? And something that I tell all of my students, whether Gen Bio 1 or genetics, is anytime you see the, the word monohybrid cross, that is telling you that we have a very, very formalized cross that we're talking about, right? We always know there's going to be a homozygous dominant parent, a homozygous recessive parent. We always know that F1s are going to be heterozygous. And we always know we're going to get a three to one dominant to recessive output in the F2s, right? It's always a very specific kind of formalized way. There's nothing that kind of goes off the wall or is weird and wacky in there. It is always exactly the same. And the same with dihybrid. And that's really just one or two genes that we're talking about. And that kind of leads into this, right? So every single monohybrid and dihybrid cross, right, always has these three generations, always. And they always have, if our assumptions are true, they always have exactly the same output, right? And so really, uh, when we talk about, which we'll get to in a little bit, monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, really what we're doing is we're using a kind of a, a framework to test our assumptions against, right? And so that's really the value of mono and dihybrid crosses, right? We don't typically do them in science just to go, oh, look, we're getting exactly what we expected, right? What we're doing is we're using those as a framework to see if we don't get what we expect. And if we don't, then one of our assumptions is wrong. And let's just type those. I'm gonna bring this up a little bit so I have a bit more space. Let's see if I actually remember them all. I think there are there are a few. So one, no mutation occur. Right. So what that really means is we end up with the same alleles that we start with. That we start with. Right. You can imagine that if we get a mutation occurring during the middle of a, a dihybrid cross, it's going to cause all kinds of craziness, right? So we're assuming that that's not going to happen. So uh, what's the next one? No selection is another assumption. And that basically means that uh, none of the alleles are either favored or disfavored. And that really, in turn, means change in frequencies. Right. And so uh, you can imagine if, for example, you're working with a lethal uh, disease, right? So something that when you have a homozygous recessive individual, that individual dies or doesn't make it to. Uh, the stage at which you're assessing a phenotype, 
right? So if that's the case, then oh, you're not going to get a three to one ratio out of a monohybrid cross, right? You're going to get a three to nothing, right? It's just going to be all of them will have the dominant phenotype, right? So that is another assumption that uh, we are making. What else we got? We've got mutation selection, um, three. Um, fertilization is random. So uh, you don't have certain oocytes getting together or certain gametes getting together based on their genotype. It's just a random uh, process. What else? Um, ba -dum -ba -dum. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Right, so that's really uh, Mendel's law of segregation. And that applies to mono hybrid and di hybrid crosses. All right, so if you have a diploid organism, then each gamete is going to get one of those two alleles. And which allele each gamete gets is totally random. Right, so for uh, one gene, uh, have a, basically you have a 50, 50 chance of getting a particular allele right. in, in a, any given gamete, prototype there. Sorry, this is a little slow typing this stuff out, but it's important to kind of get it down so that you're able to have a record of that, All right? And the final one, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, if you have two genes, right? The inheritance or how would I put it? I always struggle trying, trying to figure out a good way of saying this. Uh, all right, let's put it this way. Probability of getting an allele for one gene in a gamete has, oops, has no effect on the probability oops, of getting an allele for the other gene. And that's much better typed up as law of independent assortment. So that's dihybrid crosses. And so really that's what saying if you have two two different genes or if you have three or four or whatever, it doesn't matter how many you have. If you have two different loci in any gamete, what you get for one loci has no effect probability wise on what you get for the second locus, right? So if you have uh, an, an organism that's heterozygous, right, has two different alleles for each gene. Then for gamete one, you could have dominant or recessive for this gene or, or and, I mean, because it's another gene, dominant or recessive for the other gene. It's not always going to be dominant, dominant or recessive, recessive or whatever. It's completely random. So one gene does not affect the other gene. That's really what the law of independent assortment is saying. Anybody have any questions about those assumptions? I think I remembered all of them. Uh, 
Dr. Cook, um, can we go over, because it was confusing, the conditional probabilities when doing like a cross and the probabilities and then like the past cause triangle by doing the binomial? Uh, Pascal's triangle? You might need to teach me that, Tanya. It was um, on the book when doing the, I think it was the binomial distribution, something like that. For a dihybrid cross? I think so. It was kind of confusing because um, for like the conditional one, it was like if you, to get like an exclusion or something, like to exclude a probability. It was confusing. It was like a lot of math and fractions and. Okay. Um, there's a good chance we're going to be going through that when we, Ali, I'll just get to your question in a second. Um, we'll be going through that when we talk about probability in, in statistics in genetics, which is going to be after this. So either next Tuesday or maybe we'll start on it on Thursday. Um, but also if you could actually send me like a screenshot or something of what you're working with, uh, I'll be able to understand better kind of what it is like the context right okay. because I might know what they're talking about but I might not know the words that they're using to talk about what they're talking about so it might not make any sense uh, in that way but if I actually see what you're working with it might make it might be a lot easier to explain okay all right yeah thanks. so send, send me an email with with that and however many pictures it takes and I'll, I'll have a look through and 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 see if I can work my way through it in a way that would make sense for you uh, so Ali, yes, very good question. These assumptions are all for mono and dihybrid crosses only, right? And, and the reason for that is that, as I was saying earlier, mono and dihybrid crosses are kind of, I wouldn't want, want say the word unrealistic. That's not really the right word. Um, these aren't crosses that you'll do regularly in if you're a geneticist. Right, they're really uh, kind of like theoretical frameworks that you can use to test your assumptions. Right, and so uh, like in and of themselves, they don't have a huge amount of uh, use. But in terms of testing these assumptions, they're extremely valuable because they always have a very particular um, outcome essentially right they always have our p1 generation our f1 which are heterozygous uh, or hybrids and we have our f2 which have a very particular uh, phenotype ratio depending on whether it's monohybrid or dihybrid right and so uh, monohybrid a little bit less so but the dihybrid is a very useful one you'll actually be doing this yourself in uh, lab with the fruit fly linkage cross, right? And so you can, one of your assumptions going into that cross, and this is the one that you're going to test uh, particularly, is this number five, right? So your assumption is that your, your two genes, you're going to be working with the white and yellow genes, so white eyes and yellow bodies. Your assumption, according to Mendel and a dihybrid cross, is that these two uh, genes, uh, the alleles are going to sort independently, right? So what you get for one gene has no effect on what you get for another gene. And what you'll find out is that assumption is wrong. And so it being wrong tells you something about what the relationship between those two genes is, right? So yes, it's, it's very much just for these two types of crosses. And that's why it's worth kind of you know, learning these, it's not just a way of kind of, uh, oh, where's Mendel? We have to teach you about Mendel. But it's really uh, a very valuable kind of, you know, thinking about genetics, right? What am I working with here? Right? What are my assumptions? And when you kind of lay them down very formally, then you're able to actually test those assumptions. And, and typically what we're interested in, in terms of science, is not when things go right. What we're interested in is when things don't work the way that we think they will, because that's telling us that something is going on, right? And that something is what's interesting.
by and large. Okay, let's kind of bounce back up here. Do, do, do. Where are we are. We're not going to talk all about a bunch of peas because peas, I don't know, uh, they're quite nice, I guess, in, in a meal, but I wouldn't want to have a meal entirely of peas. Right? So, uh, just kind of bouncing back a little bit, one of the really cool things about Mendel was that um, he formalized the idea of particular inheritance. Right, that inheritance is based on a series of, I don't know if you even call them particles or factors or whatever, but something that is discrete. Right? Not discrete as in, hey, I'm not going to tell anybody, but discrete as in like a unit, right, of something. And so before Mendel, uh, inheritance was really thought to be blended, right? And so you know, if you had a, like, uh, I'm pretty tall, my wife is not as tall, right? And so according to blended inheritance, you'd expect our children to be all exactly halfway between my wife and I, right? And so if you look at enough people, you know, or if you have enough children, uh, you will see like a continuum, right? For a lot of traits, height is a classic one. Right, you don't have only tall people and only short people. You have everybody all kind of within, you know, extreme from like Michael Jordan or that Chinese basketball player, I can't remember what his name is, and, you know, really, really short people. And so it's very easy to think of inheritance as being kind of like blending stuff together, like, you know, I don't know, putting yogurt and strawberries in a blender and you get something nice and pink. But it really doesn't work that way. And Mendel was really the, the person that showed that it's down to these discrete factors. And obviously, this was in like 1850s or give it, you know, thereabouts. It wasn't until over 100 years after that that we even knew what the structure of DNA was, right? You know, for Watson, Crick, and, uh, um, and Rosalind, I can't remember her last name, Morris Wilkins, those things. Okay, so that was kind of like another another cool thing that he contributed. And so here we go. When we talk about a monohybrid cross, so we're talking about one gene. And also anytime you have any questions, just ask. We've got we've actually got a nice little bit of uh slack time uh this week, um, because I don't imagine it'll take us too long to talk about um hybrid crosses they're actually a little tricky so maybe it will but anyway if you have any questions just um, shout them out so a monohybrid cross deals with one gene we're assuming that there are only two alleles for that gene right it's not which is a kind of a wacky assumption right because most genes have some of them have thousands of different alleles but in any given individual obviously you can only have two of those right because we're, we're diploid so we're talking about one gene, two alleles, two phenotypes. Those alleles follow the classic dominant recessive pattern, right? So one allele will be dominant, the other one will be recessive. Again, that isn't always the case. But in a monohybrid cross, it is, right? It is always the case. And we have our three generations, right? This is really worth, uh, also do this in gen by one too this is really worth understanding because a dihybrid cross follows exactly the same format it just has two twice as many genes and alleles in it right and phenotypes right so it's worth getting this so that when we get to the dihybrid cross you know your, your brain stays intact so uh, we always have a p generation sometimes called p0 generation and this always has individuals which are true breeding, right? So we have a homozygous individual on one side, and we have a homozygous individual on the other side. Now, you might not necessarily know which of those phenotypes is dominant. Therefore, which of those alleles is dominant? Um, bum, 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 bum. Oh, that's actually a really good question. 
And then we just give this a, a read, bring this down. Okay, so actually that's a that's an excellent question because yes, they are random, but that randomness can be captured by probability. So for any given cross, like if we have uh, just two two individuals, two uh, let's say two heterozygous individuals, F F one generation down here. Um, we can't predict exactly what we're going to get, right? Because there is just random chance involved. You might get, like, for example, if you have kids, you might get all boys, right? Or you might get all girls. Even though if you have two children, then you get uh, fifty. You should get one boy and one girl. I have two daughters, so that's you know again a good example of that. Um, but if <laughs> if we'd had I don't know. Let's say a hundred children. A, my wife probably wouldn't like me very much, but also we would expect to get fairly close to that 50 50 ratio of boys to girls, right? Because for any given event or any given fertilization, it's random what you get, right? But if you do that enough times, and this is really what Mendel did very well, and which my wife and I didn't, because you know we only have two. Uh, if you repeat that same process enough, you collect enough data, right? Then what you will see is that your outcome is actually fairly close to what you would predict based on the probability of inheritance, assuming that all of there's nothing funky going on. These assumptions uh, actually hold true. So that's a really good question because that really gets at all of Mendelian inheritance genet uh, genetics, right? For any given uh, event, you have a certain probability, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get what you predict you'll get because it's random, right? And But if you do something a sufficient number of times, right, then you will... Uh, expect to get closer to that prediction right and so that's that's really what we're dealing with here right so every time you you know have a a pregnancy you have a 50 50 chance of uh having a boy or a girl right to get that uh to get a girl and then another girl it's going to be a probability of half times probability of a half so you're going to the actual probability of getting two girls is 25%, right? So this is just where it comes back to the math essentially involved. Um, so does that does that kind of help? In a, in a way, I'm kind of like, you know, ooh, fudging it. Um, but really, that's kind of the reality of it. You know, you, you, you can only predict what you might get, but if you do that, sufficient number of times then what you get will become ever closer to what you predict you will get right and that's also what we'll be using uh the chi-square test for and so when we get into that uh probability and statistics and genetics section we're actually going to be using um a chi-square test which is its informal name is a goodness of fit test, right? To test how well, hello, doggo, how well our um, observed outcome fits what our predicted outcome would be. Yeah, exactly, Kim. The, the more times you do this, the larger your data set, the closer to what you predict will occur, you, uh, closer you'll get to what you predict will occur. So if you can think about having uh, like 10 kids, right? I always use children because it's a fairly simple binary kind of uh, trait, typically speaking, you know, like uh, male or female uh, kids. So if you have only uh, 10 children, you know, you might get like the resolution is pretty coarse. 
right? So you might get three and seven, uh, four and six, five and five, let's say. It'd be kind of crazy to get 10 boys or 10 girls, you know? So you're, you're going to get somewhere, but the actual kind of divisions are pretty crude. If you have 100 children, you know, you might have 45 and 55 or 48 and 52, right? So now you're kind of getting closer to what you would predict, which would be a 50-50 ratio. Uh, Tanya, so yes, uh, ooh, hang on, dihybrid cross. So, oh God, that's terrible. That's not, <laughs> that's supposed to be dihybrid. Uh, I can't wait for my fingers to get better so I can actually uh, type properly. Um, yeah, so in the F2 generation of a uh, dihybrid cross, you'll always get roughly nine to three to three to one, right? And depending on how big your data set determines how roughly you'll get that. You may actually get pretty close to nine to three to three to one. And so that's kind of essentially dealing with just the random nature of biology. You know, you'll always get just randomness happening. But the bigger the, the numbers you look at, the less that randomness actually kind of affects the data and the closer you'll get to what you expect. Um, yes, Kim, a monohybrid cross is always three to one. And so actually here you can see, shoot, I'd actually have to uh, do the math on this, right? But if you work it out on your calculator or phone, whatever, these might be the data that you'd get from the F2 generation. And you can see they're not precisely three to one, right? So um, if it was, hang on, I'm going to have to work it out now. It's just kind of one of those like itches that I'm going to need to scratch, right? So what would it be? Uh, one, eight. We could even do a chi-square test. Huh? Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, actually, we're not going to do that. Not, not today, anyway. And so you divide that by, uh, that's the total number of uh, individuals that is assayed. Divide that by four. And so that's the number that you'd expect to have the recessive phenotype, three plus one into four, right? And so you can see that uh, you would expect or predict. I use the word expect because that's the terminology we use for chi-squared um, test. You'd expect to have 1,831 uh, wrinkled seeds, whereas in fact you have 1,850. And so we can actually do a statistical test to see how close this number is to this number and whether there's anything funky going on, i.e. do our assumptions hold true or not. Right. And so um, we'll actually be doing that. We might even come back and use these data uh, like on Thursday or, or next week to actually work through a chi-squared uh, chi test to see how well they, they fit. And so that's the really important thing is that this is always what you'll get, right? The actual numbers, right, may change a little bit right, because of just the random nature of, of biology and fertilization and the like. But you will always expect to get close, or you'd expect to get, get very close to that three to one ratio, right? So that's kind of where the, it's actually kind of, kind of neat. I like doing this stuff, it's fun. It's kind of like, the kind of math that I actually enjoy doing. You know, it's not like doing the taxes or something like that. It's actually kind of fun. Yeah, exactly, Rose. So that's assuming there's no mutations or essentially that all of the assumptions that I laid out earlier, that they hold true, right? That there's nothing, I like say, uh, nothing wonky going on. That's what my, my uncle always used to use that word. Okay, and so the other, the neat thing is as well, is that you don't actually have to know the genotypes of these uh, parents, you know that they're true breeding, right? Because otherwise this wouldn't be a monohybrid cross. That's as simple as it gets, right? So you know that these individuals are true breeding and one will be true breeding dominant, one will be true breeding 
recessive or homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. You don't actually have to know which is which. And do you know how you find out? Actually, this is a, this is a question to everybody. Have a think about this. How would you find out which of these phenotypes is dominant? How would you find out if round seeds are dominant or wrinkled seeds are dominant? What would you look at? The F2 generation. Not the F2, no. And Rose, kind of, not. Yeah, F1, Christina and Kim. So what are you looking for in the F1 generation? What phenotype would you expect to see? Is the well, F1 the dominant, the dominant the phenotype? The recessive disappears, right? It always kind of disappears in the F1 and then Correct. comes back oh. in the F2. That's right. And that's actually a trait of a recessive uh, a recessive phenotype that it will skip generations. Yeah, you got it, uh, Kim. Uh, is that whenever you have heterozygous individuals, right? And these have to be heterozygous because these are homozygous dominant and these are homozygous recessive or the other way around, right? doesn't really matter. So your F1 generation will always be heterozygous. And you know that if you have a single dominant allele, you'll express the dominant phenotype. And so just by looking at the F1 generation, you're like, oh, every single F1P has round seeds. Therefore, round seeds has to be the dominant phenotype, right? So I kind of, what I'm trying to do is kind of show you how because this is such a formalized kind of structure, you can actually use this to figure out information that you might not actually have, right? Or I ha, could actually uh, give you, let's say, hint, hint, wink, wink, this information and ask you, what is the dominant phenotype? You should know, right? Because um, if the F1s are, you know, let's say uh, all long necked giraffes, right? And you crossed a short neck and a long neck giraffe together, then long neck giraffe or long neckedness is the dominant phenotype, right? Because it has to be, because these are heterozygous, for example. And so the F1 generation, always heterozygous, always shows the dominant phenotype because they're heterozygous. And these are then always crossed together, right? Which is fine for peas. It's a little bit disturbing for humans and it's not quite okay for cats, but for peas, it's totally fine. Oops, and get back again. You'll always get this, uh, or actually typically, technically what you'll get, right? And we only do this for monohybrid. What you'll get is a one to one, uh, two to one genotype ratio. So that will be uh, essentially that, right? But because anytime you have a dominant allele, you'll express the dominant phenotype, you'll have a three to one oops, phenotype. Right. Oh, there's autocorrect in this, that's handy. Right, so it's gonna be uh, three, uh, three round, one wrinkled. We don't actually tend to talk about the genotype ratio of a dihybrid F2 generation, because it's just a bit too difficult. Yeah, I don't know, what should you do? Now we have... Ah, she's laying on my feet, she's changed couch. Okay, any questions so far?
Okay, so we've got a little bit on reciprocal crosses here. And basically what that means is that up here, it doesn't matter, or it shouldn't, right? It shouldn't matter whether you have uh, male plants that are homos homozygous dominant crossed with females that are homozygous wrinkled or female plants that are homozygous dominant cross with male plants that are homozygous wrinkled, you should get exactly the same outcome, right? Now, obviously, ah, here's a good question. When would you not get that outcome? When would you not, if you, when would you get something funky going on, depending on which uh, genotype the female had, and which genotype the male had? There's a really, there's not very many, but there are some uh, diseases or traits in humans which don't behave the same way depending on which one, the, which genotype the mother has and which genotype the father has. Can anybody think of any of those? Like the X linked or. Does yeah, have to exactly. Right. So, for example, hemophilia, right, or color blindness, or actually, even my daughter told me about fatal familial insomnia, which sounds like an absolutely terrible disease to have. Um, if those genes are on the X chromosome, because we're XXXY, inheritance or really expression of the, the phenotypes does not follow this normal three to one ratio, right? Because as, a, as uh, Rose put it, there's something wonky going on, right? And the wonkiness in this case is that they're sex linked or X linked traits, right? So that's actually a kind of a, a neat little aside to, to think about. And so I'm not going to go into this in much detail. It's worth reading, make sure you understand it. But this is essentially the codification of this kind of randomness of uh, inheritance. Pardon me. All right, it's basically saying that for obviously any gametes that come out of these individuals, those gametes are all going to be the same, right? So all the gametes that a homozygous dominant plant is going to produce are going to be do have dominant alleles in them, right? However, for the F1 generation, you have two different alleles, right? You have a dominant and you have a recessive. And so it's random which one of those alleles any given gamete gets, because the gametes are haploid, they only get one allele, right? And that's really what Mendel's law of segregation is all about. Now, Actually, this might be something that we can kind of wrap up today on and we'll get on to dihybrids on Thursday. If I gave you, all right, so I'm not going to tell you that I'm not going to tell you that this is a F1 generation or anything. Say I gave you a P. Exciting, huh? That is round. Right? So the phenotype is the dominant phenotype. Can you tell me what the genotype of that P is? Yes or no? 50 50 chance. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully you didn't guess correctly, but you actually you know, knew what, why you said that. But no, right? Because it could be heterozygous individual, right? Round peas. It could be a homozygous dominant individual, also round peas. So how do you figure out which is which genotype it has? Right. And so the answer is da -da -da. test cross. Super exciting. 
And I'm actually going to try and write this out rather than describe it in words because it will be next to impossible. Ugh. It's all right, doggo. Just getting my trusty, rusty board up. Oh, my dog doesn't like this. Oh, she's getting off the couch. All right, so uh, let's put this down here. Let's rotate this around a little bit. Again, my apologies for the kind of clunkiness of this, but it's going to work pretty good. So right, and I'll take a picture of this as well. So if you can't see it like super well, uh, don't worry about it too much. I'll um, I'll take a picture of this and post this on Blackboard. Right, so a test cross, basically you have an individual that is dominant and its genotype, so that's its phenotype. Its genotype could be, let's use actually D is kind of useful. Or it could be homozygous dominant or it could be heterozygous. Let's see if we can move this back just a wee bit further. I'm trying to make sure my laptop doesn't fall off my, my lap. Okay, so how can you figure this out, right? How can you figure out whether it's, you're gonna be doing a cross, right? Because that's why it's called a test cross. How can you figure out what genotype you have? What are you going to cross this individual to? What genetic background do you need to use as your tester, I guess one could put it? What genotype do you need? Would you do homozygous recessive? Yes, you most certainly would. Who is that? Uh, chance. Chance. Excellent. You most certainly would. And we'll, I'll show you why. Right, so this here is our... tester right so if you were to cross your uh i don't know what we would call this our question mark let's say and this is theoretical because we don't actually know yet until we do it so if your uh unknown was homozygous dominant cross these together, what genotype do you get? Correct, Gabriel, but why? Let's start with the genotype first, and then you can work from that to the phenotype. So what's the genotype of the individuals that you'll get from that cross? The genotype would be heterozygous. Correct, it would be heterozygous. Right, so that's a genotype. What's the phenotype? It'd be brown. Dominant. Dominant, right? Whatever the phenotype happens to be, you can use whatever you wish, right? It's going to be dominant. There you go. Sorry for the scratchy writing, right? So when you cross your tester or your your unknown to your, your tester, your homozygous recessive, if your unknown is homozygous dominant, all you'll get out is 100% dominant individuals. All right? Now, Let's kind of partition that off. Actually, let's use a different color, make it even clearer. Now, what if your unknown was heterozygous? What are the genotypes of the offspring? 
don't worry, Khaled. It's always good to, to work through this. It's how we learn stuff. What are we going to get, right? So we're going to have only dominant, uh, sorry, only recessive alleles, right, coming from our tester. What alleles are we going to get coming from our Gabriel? Actually, no. Uh, that's, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, but we're not doing a monohybrid cross here. We're going to get what uh, rows put. We're going to get either this, or we're going to get this. And because it's a 50-50 chance, you're either going to get the dominant, and this is where the randomness comes in, right, and the probability. 50-50 chance of either getting the dominant allele going into gamete and then that fertilizing, or the recessive allele going into that gamete and getting fertilized, right? You have a one-to-one -one ratio of, let's uh, so make sure you can all see this, dominant to, actually I should do that lowercase, right? If I'm being real particular. one-to-one -one ratio of dominant to recessive. So yeah, I mean, two to two is also correct rows, um, but we just simplify it to like the, the smallest numbers that we can. So it's gonna be a one-to-one -one ratio. All right, so this is how you figure out what the genotype of a dominant individual is. And you can actually work through this and try different uh, testers. Right, so if you had a homozygous dominant tester, all your offspring would always be dominant, right? That's not going to tell you anything. If you had a um, heterozygous one, maybe you could actually work with heterozygous, but then how do you know that your tester is heterozygous and not homozygous dominant, right? You would actually get different results, but it would also be really hard knowing what the genotype of your tester is because that's the whole point of doing this. So that's what a test cross is. And this is actually a pretty useful thing uh, to do uh, in genetics. I've done it a few times uh, to try and figure out what I've got. Now, let me just read Kim's question. That is, Kim, that's a very good question. And that's 100% correct for the dominant phenotype. The recessive phenotype, you can figure it out because that's the only one that uh, is, recessive genotype is the only one that causes a recessive phenotype. So if I were to give you wrinkled peas, then you're like, oh, right, that's a homozygous recessive. You know, we know what one that is. It's only when you have the dominant phenotype because it, that dominant phenotype is caused by both the dom homozygous dominant and the heterozygous genotype. Therefore, you can't figure out what the genotype uh, is. Right. So you really, you always have to go from genotype to phenotype. That's really the only way you can work these things out. It's very hard going from phenotype back to genotype. Does this make sense? I'm going to take a picture of this. So if you don't have a, a copy of it, don't stress too much. All right, so let's just change that background again. Uh, we're pretty much out of time today. Uh, what we have left for uh, Thursday, where are you at? Pardon me, is talking about dihybrid crosses. I'd actually like to finish that up kind of about halfway through class on Thursday so that we can spend a little bit of time getting going on the probability and statistics. 
right? Because that deserves uh, kind of a decent chunk of time to go through. Um, so go through this, gesture with pens again, uh, go through what we've learned today, the monohybrid cross and like the assumptions that we're working with, stuff like that. The picture in the chat will go up in Blackboard uh, in a little while. I'll do that this, you know, this morning, this afternoon. And then uh, go through the, like as a refresher, this information on the dihybrid crosses. Just make sure that's all kind of familiar. It shouldn't be too tricky. It's fairly straightforward. You just can't cut any corners. You always have to be very particular about what you're doing with the dihybrid cross. Then we'll go over that and then we'll start on the probability and, and statistics stuff, uh, which is kind of, yeah, I'm sorry, Tanya, I'm kind of, I need my coffee as well. Always kind of torn. Do I have coffee before class or do I wait till after class? You know, it's kind of, anyway. Um, and we'll go through that on, on Thursday. So have a look through that stuff, kind of get a, try and get a little bit of a feel for what we're going to be talking about. Um, and then we'll, we'll get going on Thursday. Uh, after which lecture should we start on the homework? So you can start on the homework at any point. You see all of the questions are displayed at once. So you, it's not like a linear thing that you have to go through one question at a time. And you can do the questions that you understand at any point. Uh, it's just that we're some of the, if I remember rightly, always get a little confused between homeworks one and two. Um, but if you hit stuff that we haven't done yet in class, I would wait until we do that in class to um, do it in the homework because you only get, you know, your two attempts. Um, also, what you can do is another strategy as well, which I'm totally happy with, is uh, look at those and then go, all right, we've done it in lecture. I still don't understand it. Ask me questions. In the, in the Zoom session, right? Because that's what this Zoom session is for. So don't feel like, I'm, I'm, obviously I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is, right? Because that there wouldn't be any point in that. But I will most certainly help you through the question so that you can answer it yourself. Yeah, so that's actually a good idea to start these kind of way ahead of time, right? So that you have that opportunity to kind of go through and figure out stuff that you don't know. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. That was a lot of fun. Who knew peas could be so fun, right? Uh, and I'll see you either tomorrow if you're in lab or uh, Thursday for Zoom. I'll send you a notification when everything gets uploaded. Cool. Have a lovely sunny day. What can you say about that? I guess it's kind of just San Antonio, right? It's not really that much of a surprise.